Hello and welcome to Connected with Latham, where we discuss ideas, legal developments, and business trends shaping the global economy. This is the latest episode of the Latham & Watkins Drug Pricing Podcast, and I'm Chris Schott, a partner in the healthcare and life sciences practice in our Washington, D.C. office. I focus my practice on manufacturer compliance related to the Medicaid drug rebate program, Medicare, and the 340B drug pricing program. Joining me is Danny Machado, an associate in our Washington, D.C. office. Welcome, Danny. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Excited to be back. In each episode, we will focus on a specific drug pricing topic, and after discussing the substance, we will ask the question, which Olympic sport is it like? And we have the list of Olympic sports here to see which most resembles the topic in terms of strategy, complexity, or frankly, uh, level of conflict. Danny, what is our topic for today? Our topic for today, Chris, is this policy focus on therapeutic class. Right. And there seems to be an ongoing conversation among stakeholders and policymakers around reimbursement um, and assessing value of a drug, not based on things like FDA approval or doing this separately for each drug, but frankly, across FDA approvals and drugs and looking instead at entire therapeutic classes. And so today we wanted to highlight two recent examples of this. The first is the report to Congress by the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, known as MedPAC, and the second is the Inflation Reduction Act final negotiation guidance. So Danny, why don't you start us off and talk a little bit about the MedPAC report? Yeah, thank you, Chris. And so to level set a little bit, what is the MedPAC and what is this report and why is it important? What it is, is this independent congressional agency, and it was established to advise Congress on issues that affect the Medicare program. Uh, but in addition, what they do is that they provide information on access to care, quality of care, and any policy kind of issues that affect Medicare. Nothing in these reports is really binding, but they do indicate where the policy conversation is going. Recently, the MedPAC released a new report, and this report was released on June 15, 2023. And the title of the first chapter of this report, which is a very long report, is Addressing High Prices of Drugs Covered Under Medicare Part B. So the theme here is, well, Part B as in boy drugs are just too expensive and the U.S. government is paying too much for them. They spend some time citing some research. They talk about, okay, well, we see the price of drugs going up, not just absent a generic or biosimilar, but even when there are biosimilars out there. And so what they say is, okay, why don't we think about ways to influence prices? Medicare doesn't have statutory authority to pay for drugs in a way that promotes competition with other drugs that have you know, similar therapeutic benefits or clinical benefits. So that seems to be the conversation that MedPAC is trying to foster here. Absolutely. So it seems like the suggestion there is moving away from the current ASP or average sales price based reimbursement that focuses on one billing code and for single source drugs, each one of these codes contains one drug and instead to blur across the lines of different drugs and instead looking at having a reimbursement rate for drugs um, with similar health effects. I think that's the key phrase where they want to tie these things together based on health effects. So that is, is similar to what we're seeing in the Inflation Reduction Act final negotiation guidance, where one key aspect of the guidance is how will CMS come up with its initial offer? So, so to remind ourselves, the negotiation process under the Inflation Reduction Act will start with CMS making an initial offer to the manufacturers of selected drugs. And the final guidance that recently was issued addresses how CMS will come up with this initial offer. And frankly, to simplify it a little bit, what CMS seems to be doing is what happens in real estate by looking at comparables, right? If you have bought a house, then you know that the key service your realtor provides it's looking at other houses in the neighborhood that are similar to the one you want to buy and finding out what are those prices. And those are the so-called comparables. Well, CMS is proposing or is stating that it will develop its initial offer by looking at therapeutic alternatives, other drugs that are clinically comparable to the selected drug, but that may be a brand name or a biologic, a generic drug, a biosimilar, and could even include off-label indications to treat a given indication. So CMS will begin by identifying these therapeutic alternatives within the same drug class as the selected drug, and will then look at these other drugs that are related or similar and look at that pricing to develop its initial offer 
for the selected drug. It's interesting that CMS proposed this approach in the initial guidance in March and is sticking with this approach now in the final guidance, because by definition, the selected drug is a single source drug without a generic or by a similar competitor. And it stands to reason that if there were alternatives that are equivalent or similar enough to the selected drug, they already would be prominent in the marketplace. It's, it's a question of why CMS thinks these alternatives exist um, and that CMS can rely on these alternatives going so far as looking at off-label use when it seems by definition that the selected drugs that are subject to negotiation wouldn't have these other alternative options available. And, you know, what Chris, like thinking back to the MedPAC report that we were talking about, some of the things that you're saying, you know, it's hitting the same theme. Obviously, CMS is an agency and MedPAC is coming from a different, probably, point of view. But the idea that you want to develop these reference groups, because when, when MedPAC suggests, okay, let's have one ASP-based payment for drugs that have similar health effects, we're going to have to think, what is a similar health effect to pay them similarly? And they give some suggestions. They say, well, what about drugs that have similar FDA-approved indications or even off-label use? You know, This is a conversation that is happening. If the off-label use is similar, then perhaps these drugs should be paid similarly or products that work in a similar way. So this is certainly a theme that we're seeing not just at CMS, but also on, in MedPAC and uh, certainly in Congress. Right. And I think that makes this an issue that's worth tracking, especially you raised the important point of how would the reimbursement be set, right? So what we're seeing here is a move away from the historic free market-based approach that's been prevalent in the U.S. for 30 years, where the government ties its outlay for drugs to market conditions as reflected in the price supporting that manufacturers have to send to CMS periodically. And we're moving away from that, certainly in the IRA, to a negotiation model uh, where the government steps in and negotiates. And here, by proposing to cut across different drugs, uh, similarly, it raises the question, if it's not ASP of each drug that sets the, the reimbursement rate, what would that reimbursement rate look like? How can there be a fair reimbursement uh, if it cuts across these potentially divergent drugs? Right, right. And, and their suggestion, their recommendation is to set a sort of reference price based on volume weighted ASP of drugs that are assigned to that reference group. But uh, those drugs in that reference group may very well be quite different in terms of cost to bring to market. So that it may not be quite the best way to look at it. So I think that sums up our conversation for today and leads me to the question, what Olympic sport is it? I don't know, Danny, what do you think makes sense here? You know, I was given a little thought to the different Olympic sports, Chris, and I think this one strikes me like sailing. And sailing is, according to the Olympic sports definition, it's the art of moving a boat by harnessing the waves and the wind. I think what I'm seeing here is the waves and the wind of policy moving in a very different direction from what the United States used to think of drug reimbursement as. And this whole theme that we're talking about today, where the therapeutic class or alternatives are used as the basis for payment for drugs is probably this win that we will continue to see and that we will continue to have to pay attention to. It's an interesting choice. I was thinking more in the direction of team sports because now if different drugs are bound together, CMS is forming a team here of involuntary players that have to join up together. So I was going to go with potentially hockey because it's a team sport and also one where the players get swapped out very frequently and there's a lot of adversity in, in the game. So that struck me as a good match. So I think that takes us to the end of our podcast. Danny, where are we going? What's next? Where's the after party? Chris, why don't we just go across the street? You know, our, our Washington DC office at uh, Latham is in the Penn Quarter and right across from us is this nice Italian place called Tosca. We've gone a couple times. I think I'm in the mood for some pasta. I don't know about you, Chris, but it sounds good to me. Tosca is one of my favorites, and if you ever want to meet Latham Lawyer, go to Tosca, and chances are you'll find some of us in there anytime. <laughs> Thanks to Danny for joining me, and thank you to our listeners for checking out this latest episode of the Latham & Watkins Drug Pricing Podcast, which is part of our Connected with Latham series. You can subscribe and listen to new and archived episodes of Latham's podcasts on LW.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. If you have questions or would like additional information, please email us using the links located in the show description. We hope you'll join us again next time.
This podcast is provided as a service of Latham & Watkins, LLP. Listening to this podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and Latham & Watkins, LLP, and you should not send confidential information to Latham & Watkins, LLP. While we make every effort to assure that the content of this podcast is accurate, comprehensive, and current, we do not warrant or guarantee any of those things. And you may not rely on this podcast as a substitute for legal research and or consulting a qualified attorney. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for engaging a lawyer to advise you on your individual needs. Should you require legal advice on the issues covered in this podcast, please consult a qualified attorney. Under New York's Code of Professional Responsibility, portions of this communication contain attorney advertising. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Results depend upon a variety of factors unique to each representation. Please direct all inquiries regarding the conduct of Latham & Watkins attorneys under the New York's disciplinary rules to Latham & Watkins, LLP, 1271 Avenue of the Americas, New York, New York, 10020, phone number 1212-906-1200.